Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Marcia Dietlin. You all know her from Return of the Living Dead 2. I'm having her on the podcast today to talk about that. Talk about, she was in some great TV shows back in the 90s. Herman's Head, Night Court, uh, uh, Matlock, some great movies too. Mickey Blue Eyes, Boiler Room. I'm having her on the show today to talk about all that stuff. Um, I didn't know she was on social media for a long time, and then I just typed in her name, and there she was. And um, I don't know if she's uh, that active on the convention circuit or anything, but I want to find out, you know, what she's doing now and stuff. She's, I do know she's got some uh, movies that she's doing in New York coming out that I'd like to find out about. And it's going to be pretty cool. It's going to be awesome, like always. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Marsha Dietlin. Well, it's, it's such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I'm sorry that I took me so long to get your message. Sometimes you, you don't see them for like a month, and then you're like, "Oh crap." <laughs> oh, there's some people being rude. I promise. <laughs> oh, I know. There, there's some people. Um, almost two years it took them to get back to me. So I'm very grateful. You know. Well, I'm glad I saw it. Yeah. So going back in time, um, did you gravitate toward acting early on? I did. I mean, I was one of those kids, you know, in like fifth grade when they said, what are you going to be when you grow up? I said, I'm going to be an actor. And uh, everyone always laughed at me. Um, (laughs) But I showed them. (laughs) Uh, And I did, you know, I did school plays and always performed in the choirs and stuff like that. And um, but yeah, I I always wanted to be an actor. Oh, Yeah, I've I've been telling people for years that I wanted to do show business stuff, too, and they've they've always been laughing at me, and they still are. I mean, they can't even believe I have this podcast now. (laughs) Hey, this is awesome. (laughs) Oh, thank you. So did you do uh, school plays and community theater growing up? Yeah, I did. Um, I think my first, the first play I ever did, I was, in eighth grade, and it was a high school production, so mm-hmm. that was like a big deal to get cast in, right? Because I was only in middle school, um, and it was The Sound of Music, so they had to cast younger people to play the kids, and I loved it. And then all through high school, I did the musicals, and you know, pretty much had the lead in the musicals, so, you know? <laughs> uh, and then. Um, and then my parents insisted that I go to Brigham Young University for college. I was raised in a Mormon family. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not Mormon now, but it, I was raised in Ohio in a Mormon family, which was very odd. Um, and uh, so I went to Brigham Young, and I just didn't really like the theater department there that much. It was a lot of, you know, they're very. They were kind of like the business is is really kind of evil and, you know, full of sinful kinds of people. So it's better if you become a teacher or something like that. And so I, I literally stayed there a year and then moved to California. So. Every business, including teaching, is full of evil. <laughs> <laughs> my father who was a school teacher, I totally. And my brother is a school teacher and his wife, and I, I agree with you. It's hard, isn't it? Every every profession is full of evil. Yes, I just I just I don't like that kind of discouragement. You know, I think everyone should try to go for their dreams. I agree with you. I really do. And I'm I'm at this point in time with my daughter right now, who's a senior in high school, and she's been accepted to a few colleges, and she keeps changing her mind about what she wants to do and what to study. And I'm trying to just be, you know, supportive of that, but. She's like, well, maybe I'll defer a year and just try to do acting, even though she she, she has the lead in her high school musical right now. Um, oh. But she's kind of more wanting to study. Oh, she's trying to do alarm ringing. Wait, hold on. I'm going to have to check because okay. I think it's going to do news. I set an alarm, so I 
would remember to call you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but yeah, so she, you know, she's going through that, and and as a parent, it's like I really, I really believe she should go away to school because she's ready. And I think if she doesn't do that, she might regret that. And she might defer for a year, and that's fine as long as you have a plan in place. But you know, she's going through it all, and it's it's coming up really fast for her. You know, at least. My parents were like, you're going here, and I got a full scholarship, so my dad was, you know, a high school teacher with six kids, so it was, um, you know, like, yes, you're going there, because you yeah. don't have to pay for it. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had known that when I was in high school. I wouldn't be on the crazy journey I've been on since, but that's great that you're doing that uh, with your daughter. Um, so you're originally from Springfield, Ohio? Yeah, I well, I, I yes, I was born in Dayton, Ohio, and then um, for years I lived in a smaller town called Sydney, Ohio, and then when I was in high school, I moved to Springfield, Ohio, and then my parents lived there for years, so that's where I always would go back and see my friends, and yeah, I, I get back there on a good in a good year. I get back there like twice a year. Wow, because I've been watching The Simpsons for 30 years, and I did not know where Springfield was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say, I think The Simpsons, didn't they do that whole big, they did like a whole thing where all of the different Springfields had to, yeah. to convince them to make them their state. Yeah. <laughs> I think Vermont won, I think. But, but Springfield, Ohio did something very clever and funny. I was very proud of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So after high school, did you move to New York to study acting? No, I moved to L.A. when I was 18, and um, I got married to my first husband very young, and his family had a community theater in Los Angeles called the Glendale Center Theater, and um, I, he was sort of the, his grandparents had started it, Mm -hmm. And his parents were the next generation, and he and his brother were the third generation coming into it. So, uh, so I, I met him at school, and it was like, oh, this is fate, you know. I want to be an actress, and I'm falling in love with this guy. You know, we they were doing a production of Hedda Gabler. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then uh, we moved out there, and I really, I mean, I will say that's probably where I got most of my training. Um, was just doing so many plays at that theater at such a young age. And because it was a community theater, when the actors would book a commercial or book a TV show or something for the day, yeah. I would have to learn like an entire lead role in a day and just go on stage. And uh, it, was, it was pretty exciting and pretty terrifying, but really fantastic training and sort of just, you know, doing it. You just have to do it. You have to learn it and you have to do it. Um, and I did that several times. So uh, we were together for about eight years with that first husband, Tim, and I. And uh, during that time, I started working um, more in film and stuff. So I booked a couple of commercials and then I booked, you know, the movie, which you're probably is why you're calling me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons. Flat from the past. I'm guessing it has something to do with yes. <laughs> that movie. But we don't have to get into that yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was curious. Was, was there any famous people in your um, theater or classes in L.A.? In, in those plays? Yeah. Um, let me think. There, there were some famous people who kind of had worked there in the past, like Richard Hatch. Remember Richard Hatch? Oh, from, um, was, it, was it Buck from Rogers or Battlestar? Emergency? Battlestar. No, oh, Battlestar Galactic. Yeah. Uh, an emergency, too, maybe, right? Yeah, he was on emergency, too. Younger, I think. Uh, he had done some plays there, and an actor named Sean Stevens, who was kind of a teen idol at the time, would do plays there. And one of my dear friends, Jeff Chamberlain, who was like uh, on Capitol, the soap opera, he mm -hmm. would come and do plays there. Um, and off and on, they would get people who had, had sort of good television careers, like Gordon Jump did a lot of stuff there. Um, but of course, they had the, he had the Mormon connection in common with them. Um, <laughs> the Mormon connection. <laughs> the Mormon connection. It's a pretty strong network, those Mormons. <laughs> I've got to tell you. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Did you they find me everywhere I move? Like I move so much, and they find me. Oh, that's creepy. <laughs> a little creepy. I finally called my parents out on it, and then it stopped. So I think they had something to do with it. Oh, really? <laughs> I think so. I think they were feeding them my address every time I moved. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, uh, any famous teachers? Famous teachers? Um, not really. I mean, the only acting class I ever really took out there was a wonderful teacher named Charles Conrad. And mm -hmm. he had studied with uh, the Meisner technique here in, in, in New York. At, yeah. And he taught sort of a, a similar Meisner thing, but it was much more for just cold reading and camera just to sort of it was a really wonderful technique that we could really be present with what was going on and not worried about the words you were saying and stuff like that and mm -hmm. it was just a really great way to get your energy up and be spontaneous on film I think and he was he was lovely um and other than that I mean I would say I worked with I I did I was part of uh later not much later but I had done a play, you know, in, in Los Angeles, they have these, like, 99 seat theaters, right? There's right. the equity waiver theaters, and they're small. Yeah. And, um, I, I lucked into doing a play with this really great actress named Helen Mirren. Have you heard of her? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I think, around 26 years old at the time, maybe, and she was the coolest person I had ever met in my life. You know, she was just so much fun and so naughty on stage. She was always trying to make you laugh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she, yeah, she was, but she was a real sort of mentor and just uh, we would go out afterwards and party together and, you know, it was just a really lovely cast. It was a small cast and um, I, I, I was going through my divorce and I just thought, wow, I just, I want to be Helen Mirren when I grow up. You know, I'm like, I just want to be like this fabulous lady. Um, and then out of that production, there was another woman named Angie Payton in it, and she sponsored myself and another actor to become part of this theater company, Antius, which you know of because of John Acorn, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, so that's how I got involved with the Antius company, um, with your friend John Acorn and many other wonderful, wonderful people there. You know, it was such a great thing. So that was like my classical training was just doing workshops with, you know, these incredible actors. And it was being run by this guy, Dakin Matthews, who's a spectacular actor and, and, and dramaturg. And he still, he, he, we would do like his translations of Moliere plays and things like that. And he just, it was, it was really exciting. And, um, and I got to work with this generous, lovely company of actors that I just fell in love with so many of them really and, and I'm friends with a lot of them still to this day um oh that's great so, so those were those were like my great greatest teachers I would say yeah, I, I, speaking of Helen Mirren, I interviewed um, Judy Matheson just recently, who did the Hammer Horror movies back in the seventies. She actually uh -huh. she actually trained with El, with Helen Mirren back in the sixties. They're the same age, and um, she was talking very highly of her. And um, wow, how cool is that? Yeah, she is a really cool lady. I mean, I have to say, I just uh, I, I haven't I haven't seen her since then. And my nephew moved to the city a few years ago to be an actor, and he got his Broadway break doing uh, the play of the audience with her. Um, you know, he had like one line, and he was a showman, and he basically moved a lot of furniture and everything. But I was so excited for him, and she was still just as lovely. I mean, she would go up on Saturday nights and hang out with the guys and after the show and have drinks with them, and he loved her, and, and she still is that really open, generous spirit. So I was really happy to to know that she's still like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I remember the first time I saw her, that I can remember seeing her, was in Teaching Mrs. Tingle. And mm -hmm. she is so mean and so brilliant in that movie. I love it. You know, she knows all the dark secrets of all the students, you know, and they're keeping her hostage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I, watch, I watch every 
Yeah. yeah. So how does Return of the Living Dead 2 come into your life? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I don't know, oddly, up to that acting class that I was talking to you about, that Charles Conrad acting class, we would film ourselves, like, once a week, you know, once a month, maybe. I think the class was once a week. Yeah. And, and we would film our scenes, and they had, like, a scene night, and agents, you know, would come and watch the scenes that we filmed, so we weren't actually you know, performing in front of them. And I got an agent from that. And I honestly, I think, I think that audition was maybe like the sixth or seventh audition I had. You know, I was only 20, 21 years old, I think. And um, mm -hmm. so I got the call and I just started laughing. I was like, oh my God, a zombie would be a boy. <laughs> this is hilarious, right? And I went to the audition and I just got a call back, and I got another call back, and I remember it was over Christmas time because it started filming, like, in January, and um, I had flown home to Ohio for Christmas, and I got a call that they wanted to see me again, like, between Christmas and New Year's, so I had to fly back to L.A. for a day for that audition, and I think that's the audition where I got paired up with Dana Ashbrook and Michael Kenworthy, who played my little brother in me, and um, I think I think that's and then we all got cast like over that break and uh, and I'd never been on a movie set <laughs> <laughs> and I think I lied about my age I think I told them I was 19 because I was playing like a 17 year old so I lied about my age like that could never happen nowadays because of stupid IMDB but um, back then I, I could say I was younger and they believed me so <laughs> <laughs> I kept that little ruse going until I got cast um but yeah, so I, you know, I was super excited about it, and they had a little meet and greet before, got to meet the other actors, and, uh, you know, Dana, I don't know, Dana and I are still friends to this day, and, and I just reconnected with Suzanne at, at my first zombie convention that I have done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never, some of those, that's an interesting thing, you know? uh, but yeah, we all, we all met, and and kind of bought it and then started filming. Yeah, Dana Ashbrook, his mother-in-law is Lori Cardiel from uh, George Romero's Day of the Dead, and uh, she's been on the podcast. Really sweet lady. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he told me, he talked about, yeah. It's Kate, Kate's mom, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kate Rogill, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. I love that you have this podcast for all of us old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> It, you know, I've 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 gotten you know over seven hundred plus guests, and I've just been so lucky, not just in the horror genre, but just all genres, you know. And I talk to comedians and musicians and sex experts and everybody in between. I'm gonna totally, you know, I just recently got into podcasts, and it's, it's more like the true crime ones that I'm like obsessed with. Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna start listening to your podcast when I'm driving in the car. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. That is so sweet. Yes. But, uh, yeah, Suzanne Snyder, she was supposed to do the podcast in 2018, and then she got busy with her daughter's wedding. And then um, I went to a convention that she was at, and I had met her um, earlier that year at a horror festival and stuff. And she was doing the, um, you know, the, the, the pretentious, oh, yeah, we were supposed to do that. You know, we will. And it's it hasn't happened. <laughs> oh, no. You know what? I'm going to text her and tell her she should do it. How about that? Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. I will do that. She's a sweetheart. I had not seen her in years. I mean, I think the last time I saw her, she I was dating this actor, who, and she had dated him years before that. Mm -hmm. And I was at his house in L.A., and she, like, pulled up outside, and I hadn't seen her in a few years, and... Um, and this was like 20 plus years ago. And, uh, and so that was, I think the last time I saw her. So it was super fun to reconnect with her. We had a blast actually. <laughs> First of all, totally dissing that actor that we had both dated because he was impossible. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I'm guessing it was, then, I'm guessing it was so, Wings Hauser. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was, <laughs> he shall remain nameless. No, I don't want to give him any publicity. No. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, no, he wasn't that bad of a guy. He just had his own personal struggles. Um, and but just I came along at a very bad time in his like personal growth, and she was there probably at a worse time. So 
It's fine. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> but we had so much fun just, just reconnecting and everything. And But I will definitely pass it on after I do this. I'll text her and tell her she should get in touch with you. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. It, it may not work, but I'll tell her. Yeah, it may not work, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, Tom Matthews, he's been on the podcast too. Great guy. Um, he told he told me this was not. He told me this was the worst movie he'd ever been a part of. Worst movie of his he's ever seen, but it had the best craft services. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember the craft service, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I could I couldn't tell you uh, what he said that they had, but I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> I don't remember the food, I have to say. <laughs> I just remember it was really cold. Like, we shot, I, I was. I think we shot for maybe 10 weeks or so, but half of that was, not, you know, full-on night shooting. Um, so you go to work at 6 o'clock at night and work till 6 in the morning, and we were shooting up in the Valencia area, you know? We, I think yeah. we might have been, like, the first film in those Valencia studios they had to open up. And so you're up in the desert up there, and it was so cold. It was it snowed. I mean, it was you know Southern California, and it was snowing, and we couldn't have coats or anything, right? Because we were we'd run out of the house, right? So mm -hmm. I just remember it was very very cold, and and the cast got along really well. Tommy better said that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we all got along a lot. We got along really well. I, I recently reconnected with him too. I haven't seen him, but you know we. Never met Dan, but I admired him when he played Jay Leno in The Late Shift. Yeah, well, he's my best friend, and Aww. I'm sure he would be happy to do your podcast as well. And you know, he does a lot of those Rob Zombie films and stuff now. And, yeah, um, but River's Edge certainly would fill your spot. Uh, in the past. That's a great movie. I I tried to uh, get the producers on because they did. Uh, it's the anniversary of one of my favorite '80s movies, uh, Desperately Seeking Susan. Um, oh, yeah, that's they, a great one. They produced that movie, too, and they, they were kind of cold to me, unfortunately. But, yeah, that would be great to interview Dan Roebuck. Well, he's wonderful. Um, I'm sure he would be happy to. I'll, I'll, I'll text him as well. And, um, but, uh, so anyway, Dan, Dan was directing this movie, Getting Grace. Uh, it's the first film that he's directed, and uh, I he cast me in it, and then there was a part, and I recommend kept recommending Dana, and he kept saying, I don't know, I don't think Dana's right, and I'm like, yeah, but you haven't seen him in years, and he's really cool, you know, Dana lives here in New York with me, so I see him all the time, but um, anyway, Dana sent a tape, and Dan was like, wow, that was amazing, and he cast him, so we got to do another movie together, Dana and I. Oh, nice. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, and Dan and I got to do, like, our first we we'd done small movies together, like small. I'd done like small parts in movies he was in, but this was like a real collaboration, and it's a lovely film if you want to check it out. What's it called? It's called Getting Grace and Getting Grace. Yeah, it's on Hulu, I think, right now, and probably still on Amazon Prime. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. I was, was really happy to be a part of it, and I loved working with Dan. So we're hoping to do another one. This summer too that he's written. So. Nice. Yeah. So, were you a fan of the original uh, Return of the Living Dead? Well, I hadn't seen it when I, but when I got cast in part two, I thought, well, I guess I should see it. So I saw it and I, I loved it. I thought it was hilarious and just wacky and out there, and kind of hardcore and raw and. The part of this zombie convention that I went to with Suzanne back in October, um, a lot of the Living Dead One cast was there, and it was so much fun hanging out with them and getting to know them, because I don't think I'd ever met any of them before. Yeah. But I mean, their performances are in Belize, and I mean, Tommy wasn't there, which was a bummer. I was really hoping he was going to be there. Um, but Beverly was there, and Jewel, and... I love Jewel. <laughs> and Miguel. Oh my God, they're they're all great. They're just great. And, and um, 
Clue was there. Yeah. In the 90s. You know? <laughs> now, Clue and I, we did a film together, which I had to remind him of. Um, yeah. Uh, our other friends, you know, Dwayne Whitaker. Do you know that actor, Dwayne Whitaker from I, Pulp Fiction? I know who he is, yeah. Yeah. So he's also really good friends with Dan Roebuck, and he's also in Getting Grace. And I've known Dwayne almost as long as I've known Dan. And uh, Dwayne uh, directed a movie called Eddie Presley years ago. And he had one scene where he put like this really sleazy Hollywood agent, and that was Clue. And then I played like the girl off the bus from Ohio wanting to be an actress. And he put us in the same scene together because we were like going to be dead people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Clue, like, he was like, I remember that. That was you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I saw. I remember I saw him recently in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood playing a, a bookstore clerk, and I was just laughing out loud because only Tarantino would put Clue Goliger in a movie right now. <laughs> oh, I know. It's so awesome. I haven't seen that film. Oh, my gosh. I, I have to see that film. Yeah, I'm not going to spoil an inch of it for you except for okay. telling you that Clue is in it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I know. I love that about Quentin, actually. Yeah. I'm I'm definitely going to be that way too when my movies finally get made. Good, good for you. But but the original. Hey, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying I, what what I've learned in making like, these small films because I work with Ed Burns a lot too here in New York and yeah. you know with the same cast of actors and we've done a few of his films together and stuff and um, and what Dan did so brilliantly and I'm sure Clinton does it too. It's like working with your friends just makes the experience better. Mm-hmm. And so many people they get their first like chance directing whatever and they don't they don't cast people who are close to their hearts, you know, they cast who they have to or whatever. Yeah. And I just I just think it works better when you have the first of all you're all there because you're supporting each other and loving each other and then you also have the connections and the chemistry and all of that just because you know each other and you work together and, and there's something really great I think when you're so when you're making your film I would say cast your friends if you can yeah I totally agree oh my god that this the script I wrote a couple of years ago that I just I'm still in love with it um I, I, I there's so many horror people that, that I'm friends with that I want to put in this movie um, I just, it's, I just think that it's going to change the face of horror because we're in this time now where there's too much political correctness in horror and there's nothing really taboo, you know. Right. I, I want to like yeah. put that back in, you know. Awesome, awesome. I think the pendulum has to swing back a little bit because we've gone so far. <laughs> yeah. You can't say anything anymore without getting in trouble. <laughs> it's like... Yeah. Me, I don't I'm care. So <laughs> yeah, me, I don't care though. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. You're like, fuck it. I'll say what I want. Yeah, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but uh, you know, the original Return of the Living Dead. You know, there was a lot of conflict and darkness behind the scenes, and I'm sure you've heard those stories. But uh, did this movie have any of that? I think there was a lot going on. You know, we were kind of pleasantly uh, kept out of it. But when I and I didn't really wasn't really aware of it on set. Although there was there were some issues because I think it was a non union crew mm-hmm. that they were using. Like the makeup and hair people were like union. I remember for a while, like they couldn't cross, they couldn't come to the studio, so we'd have to meet at a hotel and get our makeup done. <laughs> <laughs> like like the. No, Bell Anderson, I think was his name. He he had done the makeup for The Wizard of Oz originally. Like that 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 Del Armstrong, that was his name, I think. Wow. And, and I mean, his resume was like a novel, you know. <laughs> yeah. And his daughter was doing the hair on it, and it was really fantastic. Um, but I remember that was going on, and I think there was a lot of uh, friction maybe between Ken, the director, um, yeah. and Tom Cox, the producer. I've sort of read about some of this in the kind of and I And Ken Sweetheart also lives here in New York, and, and Dana and I have actually hung out with him a few times recently, mm-hmm. like in the last 
two years, and that's been really fun to catch up with him. But I think he was under a lot of stress that he very nicely kept from the actors, honestly. Uh, so I just remember that picket line thing, and, you know, we were working long hours, but we all got along pretty well. I think, that, I think as I said, I think the stress was happening away from the set. Yeah. And then, but also, I know Jimmy. Jimmy was very unhappy in the movie Jimmy Karen, and he's one of the most lovely gentlemen I've ever met in my life. Mm. And he, I think, mean, was very put off by some of the stuff he had to do in it, and you know, because yeah, it was kind of gross. And I don't know. He's just such a love, sweet. I don't know. I think it was hard for him a bit. But as I said, he kept that pretty much away from the set as well. So, and what a nice man. Oh, I loved him. Yeah, everybody in the industry loved him, I found out, after he died. Not just the horror people who knew him from conventions, from do, from doing these movies, but just everybody did. And yeah, he's one of the good ones. I mean, such, he just was a true gentleman. Really kind and really thoughtful and really loving and sweet. Yeah, and Ken Wiederhorn, he's such a misunderstood genius. He he did this great zombie movie in the 70s called Shockwaves that most people have not seen, and they should. I mean, it's, it's, it's a PG zombie movie, but it's really, really uh, cartoony and campy and really good. It's got uh, Brooke Adams, the little boy from Flipper, Luke Halpin, and... Uh, John Carradine and Peter Cushing and it's about these Nazi zombies that are like coming out of the water while they're on a boat oh wow I'll have, I never saw it I'll have to see it well I'm sure that's probably why he was well he wrote I think he wrote Living Dead too, didn't he wasn't he the writer as well um, he may have he may have written this one but not the the original um, no yeah I think he wrote mine yeah he also right, yeah he also did the In Name Only sequel to Meatballs, Meatballs Part 2, which I love. And he did a slasher movie called Eyes of a Stranger with a very young Jennifer Jason Lee and a coked out Lauren Tweez from The Love Boat. <laughs> <laughs> you know your stuff, Billy. <laughs> yes, I'm just the biggest movie buff there is. I love that. You know, I loved Ken, and I loved working with him, and it's been really fun to reconnect with him. He still looks as handsome as ever, and I think he went on to do more, like, television stuff. He did a lot of documentary television stuff, um, and um, he's retired now. So. Mm -hmm. I'd like to interview him. Well, I can reach out to him, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He doesn't, he doesn't really go on record talking about the movie very much, does he? Oh, that's sad. I haven't seen him go on the record really talking about it much. A little bit, but, you know, because I get calls to do these books and yeah. interviews for different, um, we're living, there's one that's like the five Living Dead movies, and there's another one that's, I think, probably 80s horror films or something like that. But I, uh, I don't think him, he doesn't, he doesn't like to put it out there that much. Wow, that's but, sad. Yeah, you, you should reach out to him. He's, He's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And I heard a young Doug Benson play the zombie. Did he? Yeah. Yeah, he probably did. <laughs> yeah, he talked about it on a podcast recently. I heard him say, I just, I was just like, oh, God, I got to watch the movie again to find him, you know. No, which one was he? He wasn't one of the guys who played, like, multiple zombies. He only played one. Yeah, he only played one. I think... Um, Let's see, I know Alan Troutman played Tar Man like he did in the first one. Yeah. And then, yeah, then there was a guy who played multiple in there. There were a few, well, Brian Peck. Brian Peck was one of the tough rockers in one. And he was multiple zombies in ours. So he was like Michael Jackson zombie, and he was like the old lady with a purse getting out of the grave who gets, like, stomped on, and mm -hmm. he played a bunch of them. They had sort of, like, high four or five people. One was a woman, and the rest were, were guys, and they played, like, the main zombies with all the different makeup looks, and, like, they really extensive makeup. Yeah, that, that, that Michael Jackson one was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's Brian. I'm pretty sure that's Brian. <laughs> yeah, that's that was awesome. <laughs> I think the effect, I mean, Ken 
Penny Myers is a genius, I think. I think the effects were fantastic in ours. And the makeup was incredible. And he, he was a sweetheart. Mm-hmm. Mo- moving on from that movie, though, uh, you did an episode of Herman's Head. <laughs> yes. How was that? <laughs> Well, Billy Rexdale and I are still friends. <laughs> oh, another one I've been trying to get. <laughs> oh, he's on Facebook. Reach out to him. We're friends on Facebook. I did. I did um, reach out to him. I, I, I never heard back. <laughs> I, haven't seen him. I haven't seen Billy. Actually, Billy, I also had re- when Dan was looking for someone for getting grace, I was like, well, you know, Billy Rexdale lives here now, and Dana Ashbrook lives here now, you know. So, um, but uh, I had a great, you know, that was. Oddly, I remember the audition for that, for the audition for the pilot, uh, not to be like James to this part, but just to be like the guest star girl of the pilot. Right. And um, I remember auditioning because Dan Roebuck and I used to go to auditions with each other to support mm-hmm. each other. And so if he had one, I would go and carry his water bottle and you know his size or whatever, and he would do the same thing for me. And I was auditioning for it and. The casting director was like, well, Dan, why don't you come in and read with her? That's going to be better because she knew Dan. And so he read with me, which I think changed everything. And so I, I made it to, like, the finals for that, and then they cast someone else. But then, like, two episodes later, they just offered me, you know, the guest star girl of that episode. Um, so I had a great time on that. And they were really nice people. Hank Azaria is a sweetheart. Yeah, I, I ran into him over the years, and he's always like, hey, Marshall, how's it going? And I sort of hung out with them a bit and became friends with them. And I would see Billy at auditions all the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, he it's suffered. Nice well, Fright Night 2 suffered from the same effects of uh, Return of the Living Dead 2. You know, they, they just didn't uh, get a good story going for uh, that one. You know, they, they, they were going to do a third Fright Night, and then, um, what's his name, Menendez, who was the head of uh, live entertainment, died before that could happen, and then the guy who came in after didn't want to make a third Fright Night. Um, that's too bad. Yeah. I enjoy the Fright Night movies. A funny story I heard, too, you know, you know Menendez was a well-known bully and jerk and all that stuff, and um, B- uh, Billy Ragsdale and Roddy McDowell didn't like him, right? So after... Uh, they found out that he had been killed by his sons. Um, Roddy McDowell uh, called uh, Billy oh, Ragsdale. Bat Menendez. I didn't realize you were talking about Bat Menendez. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Roddy McDowell called Billy Ragsdale and said, I don't have an alibi, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's classic. <laughs> That is so funny. Oh my gosh, I was glued to that trial back in the day. Oh, yeah. Or TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, Molly Hagen is in that episode. Molly, yeah. And Molly, also, I occasionally run into uh, from time to time. In fact, I think Dan has worked with her recently, and he was good. I think he might have reached out to her about a different part of Grace, actually. She has a sweetheart, too. Yeah, I, I was trying to get her, too. I heard she has a really good sense of humor. She's great, yeah. She's super nice and super great. And uh, Yardley Smith, she has, a, like, a true crime podcast. I heard that. Because I, I, I was looking for a new one, and I saw that, and I was like, I don't... I, I'd be curious to listen to it, because can you imagine Yardley, like, with that Lisa voice, like, doing true crime podcast? Oh, I've, I've heard her on, on, like, Mark Maron's podcast just saying fuck and shit and all that. I was cracking like, up. Oh, it's Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. She's funny. Yeah. She's very <laughs> funny. I will check out her podcast then. You did an episode of uh, Night Court. I did. That must have been a lot of laughs. <laughs> That was a lot of laughs. It was actually so fun. So that, it ended up being, it was the finale of the series finale. Mm-hmm. That episode. Um, but it was a two-parter, and I think I'm only in the first half of it. Um, but I play John Larkett's fiance. But then we break up because I find out that he's dated my mother before. So that breaks us up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you? That cast, they are the tallest people. That cast, everyone 
was a giant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I've never seen this tall people in my life. I mean, more people look like normal, like 5'7 or whatever. But they're all like 6'4, 6'6, 6'9. I mean, they, they cast everybody to call them and show you had no idea how to get to the old order. Yeah. Did, did you get to meet Mel Torme? No, I didn't. That would have been amazing. He, he was a close friend of my great uncle. Oh, I love Mel Torme. Yeah. That's pretty cool. No, he wasn't on my episode of that. They were really nice. I mean, that, that was like the easiest job I ever had. They were just a boil oil and cheese. And I was like, ooh, 11 seasons or golf season or something. It was um, a great show. And my show. parents were super excited because it was like, yeah, it's a weird show. Like, you see now, they'll call me. He's like, I just saw you. I might go to get it. He wants his next TV brand every night. Yeah, that was a great show. I remember you. Was it? I'll go ahead. There you go. Oh, I was going to move on to the next thing. I waited ahead. <laughs> I remember seeing this one movie you did a lot on HBO back in the 90s, this movie called Only You. Uh-huh. Right. Is that with Ed Roebuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I play his wife in that, but all my lines are in that cut. So. <laughs> but I still like to play his wife. <laughs> That's a funny movie. I like that movie. Yeah, it, it's one of those those misunderstood movies. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's always hard when you have, like, a hot girl and then, like, the not as hot girl. And, you know, it's, it's hard to it make you feel a little objectified, I guess. Like Kelly, Kelly Preston, right? Wasn't it Kelly Preston? Kelly Preston, Helen Hunt, Andrew McCarthy. Right, right. And, uh, and but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Betty Thomas directed. How was she? Oh, she was great. You know, I went into that movie because basically it was a small part. And this manager at the time, Wayne Rice, was producing that film. And I think I had auditions for the Kelly Preston part. But um, because I knew Wayne and stuff. But uh, so they just basically were like, well, our friend Marsha is going to play this. And Betty Thomas was just she was great. She was really great. Just calm and professional. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm getting a spam risk call. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but she just, she was fantastic. I mean, what a great lady. Yeah. And where was that beach resort at? Um, I don't remember because I was just shooting like inside the house. So I think we were somewhere in Hollywood. I'm guessing, I don't know where they shot that, actually. That, that would be a good super dead robot if, when you have them on the show. Because okay. um, I never made it to the beach. But it was, I think it was local in California. Nice. I don't, I don't think they flew away to film anything, as I recall. But I could be totally wrong about that. Mm-hmm. How about working on Matlock? Well, again, with... Dan Rubuck. <laughs> Yeah. I wouldn't have a career without Dan Roebuck. Um, and he might not have come a few parts without me, you know, going to auditions with him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that was a blast. Uh, it was great because Dan, he has a great, if you ever have him on your show, I have to tell you the Andy Griffith story because it's a really wonderful story uh, yeah. about how he ended up on that show. And it was really all to do with Andy Griffith. Um, but I had, I had a, for an episode and not gotten them, then they gave me this, it was like a two episode arc, so it ends up being one of those, like, Matt Long TV movies, which is kind of fun, right? So it airs a lot. Uh, and that was worse because we were shooting in Wilmington, North Carolina at the time. And so I got to go there, and I remember it was right around Christmas, and it was warm, but we were shooting out on this, one of those islands, sort of close to the Outer Banks. Um, and the, it was closed for the winter, so we had the entire resort to ourselves, just for the cast and crew and everything. Yeah. And it was blast. It was blast. Yeah. I've been interviewing a lot of people lately who worked on that show. Someone I interviewed said uh, they uh, he wasn't allowed to uh, talk to Andy Griffith. And then another person said uh, she was on multiple episodes. She got to spend time talking to him. Oh, he was. He was great with me, but I came in as Dan's best friend, and he loved Danny. So, 
I remember I was single at the time, and, and Dan was like, well, wouldn't you come? You can't say love phone. And he was like a film operator. <laughs> love phone. And I was like, well, of course I'm going to say love phone if you tell me I can't say it. <laughs> so Andy loved that love phone and I started dating. And so we'd be on the set, and I'd hear him be like, love phone, get over here. <laughs> Are your intentions good with this young lady, you know, and everything? So he, he got a big kick out of it. He was great. I mean, what a professional. He, you know, that show had it down because he would come in. He always wore the same suit, right? Yeah. So he never had to change his clothes. He never had wardrobe changes. He would come in and they would shoot. At least when I was there, he would shoot in the morning. And he had, you know, he memorized every day. He wasn't using cue cards, which I've heard of, like, other shows. Some actors have to use cue cards and stuff. He had everything down, but they would shoot all of his coverage in the morning mm-hmm. so that he didn't have to work all day. So he'd be done by like noon or whatever. So what that meant though for us, because if it's like different days of the trial, I think I went through like 10 different hairstyles that morning. <laughs> 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 like, oh, this day, and I have to change my wardrobe and change my hair for every single... And finally we're like, this is why Andy's got it down. He wears the same hair and he wears the same suit. <laughs> 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 well, he always had that white suit on and that black tie. <laughs> yep, yep. Same hairstyle, same everything. And I was like, that was very flirt of you. <laughs> yeah. I think it broke new ground for lawyer shows, too, because until then we had seen the same lawyer. It would be, he'd either be like a tough guy like Perry Mason or um, a neurotic, you know, Jewish Harvard-educated New York lawyer. But, like, Matlock broke new ground showing, you know, how they are in the South. Yes, he was. Yeah. You got cast in a small role in Mickey Blue Eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Maddie, Maddie Corman and I talked about this movie uh, last year, and uh, she told me it was really fun and really funny to do. And I, I forgot Maddie's in that movie. Yeah. Oh, I love Maddie. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, I was, I had one that, very quick little scene with the fortune cookie where it's a pretty like, iconic scene actually where he's proposing through the fortune cookie and the, the at a Chinese restaurant and the owner of the restaurant gives me the, the cookie instead. So I'm at the other table like, Oh my gosh, yes, I'm marrying you. Blah, blah, blah. And so anyway, it was a very quick scene. I, I had very little feel in it. Um, Hubert was a, a gentleman and, uh, was really was, but I think they were kind of fighting that day, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they were a couple, man. You know, there were some issues going on, but I think they were personal, not, you know. Yeah. Um, but he was a sweetheart. I, I had very little to do on it, so, you know, yes. Yeah. I'm sure it would have been fun to be on more, more than day one, just one day. Yeah. I like the movie a lot. I think it's really funny. Yeah, it is a very funny movie. You know, he uh, has that dictation recorder, and he's like, note to self, watch Godfather 1 and 2 and Goodfellas. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I love Hugh Grant. I mean, I, I watch him, and I can watch him in anything. I, I went to go see a movie recently, and there was a trailer for a new movie he has coming out where he had a beard. And I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Hugh Grant's back. I haven't seen him in a while, you know? And he... he He's aged, but he still looks pretty good. He looks great. He looks great. I, I wanted to see that thing on, I think it's on Netflix, the, the movie where he plays, he's like a politician or something who's in love with another man, like a gay politician or something. Oh, I didn't know that. I think it was out last year, maybe. I think oh. he was nominated for a bunch of awards for it. Oh, I gotta check that one out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what it is, but look it up. It's, it's, I think it might be a true story. Mm-hmm. Like in British politics. So. How did you get uh, so lucky with Boiler Room? Oh, I love that movie. What we a good did. movie, right? Yeah, it, to me, it's by far the best thing Ben Affleck has ever done. I agree with you. I think he's fantastic. And also, um, um, Vin Diesel is so great in it. Yeah. Right? Vin Diesel, yeah. So, and Giovanni Rubisi is, I think it's the thing. He's so good in it. Uh, 
I just auditioned for it. I auditioned for it and got cast. And uh, it was a great story because it was the director, Ben, what's his name? Ben, do you remember the director's name? Oh, um. Ben, Ben, it's Ben, I think, right? Let me look it up. Anyway, he was a grip on movies, Mm -hmm. you know? So he had written this amazing script. Ben Younger. uh, Ben Younger, yeah. Yeah. He's so cute, too. (laughs) <laughs> um, I had a bit of a crush. I, had, I must admit, uh, <laughs> but he, he, so because he was a grip on a film, like the whole crew were like his buddies, and everyone was there just really wanting to support him and his first movie. And he mm-hmm. was a sweetheart. Yeah, I used to hang out with this girl that had a crush on me. She was a self-proclaimed nymphomaniac, and oh, lucky you. <laughs> no, no, I, I, it was it, it was just a. I just saw her as a friend, you know. And she went crazy on me, and we're not friends anymore. That was a long time ago. But she used to watch this movie all the time. Every time I turned around, she was watching it. Really? Yeah. Because she liked, she liked Giovanni Ribisi and Ben Affleck. She thought they were both really cute. <laughs> well, good. I mean, they're not very sexy in it, but okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a really good movie, though. I, it, it is. That was a pleasant one. Like, I had read the script, and I didn't even read a lot of it, because often I'll just read I'm involved in or my character is involved in because mm-hmm. I feel like that's all you really know about the movie um, and all you should know uh, and you know just if, they're, if they're talking about you you should know that and stuff but um, I just remember going to see it and, and, and thinking wow this is actually a really good film yeah Sometimes you have people, they'll, they'll just get the uh, their part in the script and not the whole script, and they'll go see it, and they're like, oh, God, what did I sign myself up for? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember I did a film, I know I'm moving ahead, and you can go back if you need to, but go ahead. a film called Little Children. Mm-hmm. It's an incredible film, and uh, I that, I read the script and thought it was fantastic, and, you know, Kate Winslet is extraordinary, and Patrick Wilson is gorgeous and awesome in it but um and i read the book that it was based on which i loved but then i remember when i saw the movie i was like oh my god todd field is a genius because he took that script which was a really good script he made it so much richer and darker and just the performances jackie earl haley is brilliant in it have you seen that film no, not yet. Oh, you must add that to your list. It's a really good film. Called Little wow. Children? Little Children. And it's fantastic. It was nominated. Kate was nominated for an Oscar for it, I think. And, uh, and yeah, actually, because I remember when they showed the scene at the Oscars, it was the scene, one of the scenes I was in. <laughs> I was like, oh, I've been at the Oscars now. <laughs> Oh wait! Oh wait! Um, second, is that the is that the movie where um, where Jackie uh, Jackie Earl Haley's the pedophile? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I I know what movie you're talking about now, but I, I I didn't get to see it, but I was actually rooting for him to win the Academy Award because every time an actor that I think needs his due or an actor that I liked and never expected to even get a nomination does, I you know I want them to win. I wanted him to win badly. I did too. I really wanted him to win. Ask you about uh, you did you did an episode of the short lived Michael Richards show. <laughs> you just pull out all of these wacky things. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was so interesting because I had come to India for the first time and I've been in India for like six weeks and I've been really sick for like the last two weeks of it because it's really hard to stay not sick in India. I love India. I've been back since and never been sick like this. But um, I I. And I flew to LA just to visit Dan and um, uh, 
I, I got this call and they said, do you need to go in? It, it, it was one of these things, you know, a book that was work. You, you work for like a week and then they take it the last day, right? Yeah. In front of an audience. <laughs> but it was that taping day and they wanted to recast the person that they had cast. So it was one of those things like you go in, if you get cast, you're taping tonight. <laughs> Before you know that 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 meltdown he had at the Laugh Factory, I think you know this show really just you know just you know really killed his career because you know he was Kramer. <laughs> I know he was Kramer. He was really lovely to work with, though. I will say he was he was fantastic, and you know I had just come in that last day, so I was like trying to memorize everything, and he was really helpful and really sweet, and really actually interested in the whole India journey. Like we talked about that a lot. That's good. Yeah, I've heard some people have had, you know, good and bad experiences with him, you know, but that's uh, that makes sense, though. Yeah, I had a great experience with him. So I was reading that uh, you got a couple new movies in the works. Are you allowed to talk about them? Yeah, sure. Um, so one, actually, is with, guess who? With Dan, Dan Rubuck. Rubuck. <laughs> Well, there's one movie here that I got called The, the Hail Mary. The Hail Mary. That's the film that we're hoping to film. That, that's oh, okay. The film that Dan Roebuck is directing, yeah. Oh, okay. That we're hoping to film this summer. And I, and I, um, I, see, I, I see that Sean Whalen is in it. I just met him at a convention. Oh, I didn't know that. I have to look at that page. I don't want to play the part he wants me to play in it, so we're, we're having discussions. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I want to be one of the nuns. And he's like, you can't be a nun. I guess I can. <laughs> I was uh, watching this on-camera podcast you did about a year ago on YouTube, right? Yeah. And in that, you told a, a pretty interesting story uh, you have about Rob Lowe. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get away from that story. <laughs> <laughs> that, I tell you, that story is like my end with anybody. All I have to do is say... I made out with Rob Lowe when I was 17, and people are like, what? <laughs> That's a good story. Do you want me to tell it? Yes, go right ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, this will give you a good idea of like how much I worked it when I was in high school. Um, I worked at the local movie theater, and Rob Lowe's grandparents are from Sydney, Ohio, the town that I grew up in. And I heard that he was coming to the theater because the mayor was going to give him a key to the city. And he was already Rob Lowe by then. Like, he'd done, I think he'd done The Outsiders already. Uh, the movie Class was coming out. Remember that movie? I where, lo- love that movie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was actually, like, coming out. So Class was going to be playing at the theater. So he was going to come and get the key to the city, and then they were going to show his movie Class. And I worked at theater, and I was like, you know, when people get awards, they often have, you know, an escort. Someone comes to, like, walk them down to get their award. And the owner of the theater said, oh, that's a really great idea, Marsha. Would you want to do that? And I'm like, oh, gee, I guess I could, you know. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And I'm like, and my friend Susan could do it, too. Like, two of us could, you know. And Anyway, so I worked that, and then... He showed up, and he was with his little brother, Chad, and, you know, we walked him out. I actually have a picture from the newspaper that, like, refers to me as Marsha Bradley, his escort. Can <laughs> 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 you imagine nowadays? And then they give, like, the address of his grandparents, where they li- where he lives, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and so, anyway, we were going up to watch the movie, and I was sitting between Rob and Chad, and Chad leans over, and he goes, my brother wants me to tell you that he likes you. And I was like, really? And so I think we ended up, like, starting holding hands during the movie. But anyway, we ended up going out after and making out, and, you know, I could have totally lost my virginity to Rob Lowe, and I wish that I had in hindsight. I really do. Or it's... Sorry, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> or at least... <laughs> Or, or you could at least gotten a finger bang from him. <laughs> something, something. I was like such a goody two shoes. We had a very nice makeout session in the backseat of a car, so that's that's nice. Yeah, was he a good kisser? It would have been a much better story if I actually gone through with it. Yeah, was he a good kisser at least? Oh my gosh, he was dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my I town did too. <laughs> So class hadn't come out yet, you said? I think class had come out. That's why they were showing it at the theater, and I think that's why they were giving him the award. So it was right when class was released. Okay, so they probably kind of knew who he was when you walked in the bar with him. Oh, yeah, they knew. (laughs) I mean, they've been at the thing. Like, they they come to see the movie, and then I end up going out with him. (laughs) 
they were there, like, meeting him, right? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah, they knew. <laughs> they knew he was with me. <laughs> the guys the guys who made class, Jim Quoth and David Greenwald, right, they became very successful in TV later on. And they never talk about the movies they made from the 80s in interviews except for class because they – like to take credit for discovering Rob Lowe, Andrew McCarthy, and John Cusack. <laughs> but they were already discovered at that point, weren't they? <laughs> I, I th- I, well, I think Cusack uh, was discovered at that point. Because he did that, and then he w- he did 16 Candles. He had a small part in that. And then um, he did Better Off Dead and Sure Thing, and then he was huge after that. Yeah, yeah. I think Rob, Rob had already done The Outsiders, I think, probably. Right. Okay. I think. I don't know, but I think he had. I mean, he'd already done some stuff, because I, I certainly knew who he was. And I, I'm guessing it was probably The Outsiders. And St. Elmo's Fire, maybe, already. Oh, no, that was later. That was, like, 85. Was later? Oh, yeah, so not that. Yeah. 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 This that... would have been, like, 83. 83. Yeah, that's the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy. <laughs> okay, I was born in 63. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Marsha, here comes the fun part of the podcast. Uh, there's a silly game that I play with my guests. It's like um, it's like an anti-James Lipton questionnaire on Inside the Actor Studio. It's slumber party questions. And awesome. how this works is... I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the same question, and I answer it. Okay. Marsha, are you ticklish? Yes. Are you ticklish, Tommy? I am baby ticklish. I don't know what that means, but awesome. (laughs) I get a knee-jerk reaction if someone tickles me. I've been known to hit some people in the groin. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Um, is your belly button an in or an Audi? My belly button's an innie, and even though I've had a baby, it's still an innie. Yes. <laughs> and you? I have a deep innie. You have a deep innie. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I interviewed uh, uh, Femi Taylor, who played Ula in Return of the Jedi, and she told me um, she had she had this big old Audi belly button when she was a baby, right? And she sent me a picture yes. Of her as a baby with it, I oh my god, it was it, it's like it's like she had like a baby penis in her stomach. <laughs> oh, like a yeah, <laughs> yeah, I could not believe it. I was just my jaw dropped. <laughs> oh, I think it was a baby hernia. <laughs> yeah, it had to have been. <laughs> but then again, she's British, and I'm sure they didn't know that back in the sixties. <laughs> Um, what color are your toenails painted? Oh, I just got them done right now, and they're gold sparkles. Nice, nice. Yeah, and you, do you paint your toenails? I do paint my toenails since I was 13. Um, right now, they're, they don't have a color, but last time they did, they were purple with sparkles. And Actually, sparkles are good. Yeah, and in, in May, I'm going to L.A. for a week, and I like to... Um, Make, do elaborate colors when I go out to LA. I don't know what which one I'll do this time, but I'll figure it out by then. Maybe some gold sparkles. Oh, that is an idea. You know, I just don't. Great. I just don't like. Yeah. yeah, I just don't like. I don't really like. You know, a whole lot of glitter because it takes forever to get that shit off. I know that's why I like it because it makes my pedicure last for like a month. Oh. <laughs> it's like shellacking it on there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then um, my favorite question, uh, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Oh, okay, yes. And I'll tell you. So I live in a New York City apartment, Mm -hmm. and my neighbor was having trouble with her plumbing. And the super, while he was trying to fix her plumbing, like, cut a, like, did a big hole in our wall, right? (laughs) Like, broke through our wall. So he sort of filled that in, but then it was still kind of all peeling and everything. And every day, I don't know what she cooks, because I thought it was sewage coming through my wall that I was smelling. But he said, 
it now it's the kitchen, but it's like this boiled cabbage rotten. See this kimchi she's making or something? It's like this rancid, rotten cabbage, hideous. And it would come into my apartment every day. And I wanted to show up. I was like, oh my God. So finally I got a system of the wall. Because then I would like try to light like a candle over it. And then it would just be like rotten cabbage mixed with vanilla or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or citrus rotten cabbage. Um, but he finally fixed the hole and I'm not smelling it anymore. And I'm so happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, mine, I, you? Yes. I, uh, I can't stand farts or stinky feet. Oh yeah, stinky feet isn't. Farts I can kind of deal with, but stinky feet is not very good. I, I interviewed an actress. She told me she loves the smell of her farts. I don't mind the smell of my farts. I, I, I'd rather <laughs> smell my farts than anybody else's farts. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm kind of, I'm kind of in the middle. Yeah. I um I, I had a car accident five years ago, and the last month I was in the hospital, uh, I was very grumpy from the medication they gave me. I um, they refused to like go near me uh, a lot of the time unless they had to give me medicine or a shot or something, and so they didn't change my socks. So I had really bad athlete's foot for about six months until I find oh. I finally. Uh, just realized I gotta do something about this, and it's it's gone now. I just put a lot of um, you know lotion on it, and I soaked it every day. Good, that's very good. And that antifungal spray. Oh. It was pretty bad. Yeah, it was the worst oh. ever. And it's so itchy and awful, isn't it? Uh, for me, it wasn't that itchy because um, my foot had lost a lot of nerve endings, so I can't really feel a whole lot in it. But just the smell was just bad. Oh. But I'm glad you have it under control. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it was a crazy time. But uh, I was curious, do you have any upcoming uh, convention appearances? Uh, I think I'm supposed to be at one in, like, July. That's, like, my, I think. They've asked me last October, but I haven't heard more about it. But it's, like, mid-July. It's a day, day of the dead convention in Indianapolis. Oh, yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about that convention. Yeah, I hear it's a good one, too, but I don't know if I'm still involved in it, but at the time, I was going to be there as Dana and Tommy, possibly Suzanne. Yeah. Uh, so, but like I said, I haven't heard recently, although it's still pretty far out. So, um, so maybe come to Indianapolis. <laughs> Here's one, too. If- <laughs> And well, if you get booked in California, I will definitely be there because I go. I will let you know. Yeah, that'd be fun. Because I because yeah because you know I go um, to cons in in San Francisco because that's where I'm from. I go to L. A. I go to Sacramento. All the cons um, for for Comic Con and Horror Con and all that stuff. And um, I'll tell you something. I have a lot of trouble meeting uh, my guests sometimes at conventions because I just want to go over and say hello and their handler thinks I'm just some crazy ordinary fan, you know? <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Well, make sure, make sure if I'm, well, I'll let you know if I'm not in any of those. I haven't done a lot of conventions, but I don't think anyone really wants me. Yeah. That's why I don't oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, I did this one in, in Orlando, and it was kind of sad because it was, a, it was called Phantasm, and it was the first time they were doing it. It was a beautiful resort hotel and it was they treated us so great but they had they had a really small turnout and it was it was really I felt really bad for the people running the convention because they just weren't making anybody's guarantees and stuff. But um yeah. but but because of that, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to the people who were there. Like we, people would come and talk to you for an hour, you know, it was just there just wasn't there weren't lines or anything. So it was it was kind of nice that way. I met some really, really sweet fans and, you know, kept in touch with them a little bit and really nice people. And so I was glad that that was my first sort of foray into it uh, just because it was more personal. Yeah, I, there's there's some shady shit going on in the convention scene with a lot of those people who do a convention like every weekend. It's just it's, yeah, it's starting to become 
yeah, it's just starting to become more about money and not the fans, and it's it's really sad. But it's yeah. a, it's an amazing time though. At the same time, for conventions because people you know that you would never think do conventions do them, and you get to meet them. You know, even uh, if it's you know. If, even if you're the only one there, you know, going to talk to them or you're in a line that's like three hours long. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing time for conventions. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, Dana, Dana Ashford used to refer to them as like the has-been conventions or whatever. Yeah. That's not the way it is anymore. It's like the, you know, the, the today stars go and do them now. And, and uh, yeah. that's changed it too. I think I probably would do more conventions if it was still more the has been. <laughs> well, I'm going. Okay, I told you I was going to LA in May uh, for a week. I'm going to go to uh, Monster Palooza. That's that's my horror con I go to every year in LA. Yeah. And then I'm going to uh, the Hollywood show where you got this eclectic mix of you know stars going back to the '50s in movies and TV there. And oh God, they got Robert Wagner at the one at the one that I'm going to. It's a huge, awesome. yeah, huge eclectic mix. I just, I, I can't wait. It's going to be my first one, so I'm excited. Oh, I love that. That's so good. Well, c- congratulations. Have a fantastic time. Um, I'm going to reach out to Dan Roebuck and to Dan Snyder on, on your behalf. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Marcia. I appreciate that. Let, let me send you off with this joke here. Okay. You know the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? <laughs> you're close you're close it takes a man 20 minutes to find a golf ball <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> <laughs> thank you that was a good guest. <laughs> yeah it was a good guest you're I, I i've had people guess that one and you're you're like the only one who's like come close <laughs> yay <laughs> well thanks so much let me know let me know when i can listen and where I can listen and, and to this podcast and then I can listen to other ones. Are you on Spotify? I'm on uh, YouTube only. <laughs> okay, that's cool. I have YouTube on my phone. <laughs> yeah, it's easier that way for people. So yes, um, I'll uh, let's connect on Facebook and I'll tag you in this when it's edited and uh, everything. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Marcia. You have yourself a wonderful, I guess it's almost nighttime over there. <laughs> well, it's four o'clock. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. funny. <laughs> okay, rest of your day and night. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Marcia Dietland, Ain't She a Sweetheart? Oh my God, what a great lady. What a fun, great lady. Those are the kind of interviews I love. People who are just personable, approachable, funny, and engaging. That's the kind of interviews I like. And I've been having a lot of them lately, and I hope it continues. I can't stand having one word answer people or just people who don't give you nothing. But Marcia, you gave me an awful lot. Thank you so much. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.